Amazing how many plants are bulbs. And we're working on what I call lions and tigers and bulbs. And we talk about bulbs, stem tubers, root tubers, corms, and occasional rhizome or two. Marilyn. And this is the first one that goes alphabetically. And this is called the acidanthera. And when you go over to Lowe's or Home Depot in the spring, you will always find a half used box of bulbs that is entitled Acidanthera. And my suspicion is that a lot of the customers that come in seeing the word acid think that they're harmful if they're not handled properly and just forget about them. But this is the flower and they are hardy here. If you put them in good soil and put them down the, the corms about six inches and they come up year after year. And they're corms like crocuses. And they have a fragrance at night that is literally soul wrenching. It is so sweet. And these are acus. And this is, um, well, let me go back here. I thought there was more pictures of this. This is another bulb. And all of the bulbs that I have in the list that I gave you, if you look them up, these are all the botanical, the scientific name. There is no such thing, by the way, as a botanical name. Plants do not have botanical names, they have scientific names. And this is another plant that is absolutely beautiful in mid to late spring. And the following are all onions. They're flowering onions. And you know, because if you take a pinch of the leaf, you smell onion. And these are the seed pods of Alium creditivis. And this is Alium molloy and Alium christophii. Wow. These stand up on four foot stems. And they are roughly about eight inches wide the globe of these flowers. And it's so hard to believe that you're dealing with an onion, but you are, and they're absolutely beautiful. And then there's always a plant somewhere in the world that I think was created to make people blush. And this is the Amorphophallus reverii. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's one of the ugliest flowers you will ever see in your existence. Now, not only that, it smells terrible because it's pollinated by flies. And one year I grew them in the greenhouse and Jean never forgave me because when you opened the door to the greenhouse, it probably smelled like Chicago if it closed down for a month and they turned the electricity off. Here's another one peeking at you. This is Amorphophallus napaliensis. But they are wonderful to have in the garden and they are marvelous to have, especially when you have the older members of the Women's Garden Club of some kind come through because you can see they all avert their eyes. And anemones, which are also called windflowers. And this is coronaria, another absolutely beautiful flower for mid to late spring. And erysema, this is erysema griffithii. And these are all 
related to the jack in the pulpit because you notice they have that wonderful flower that opens up with jack and then inside the pulpit. And here is the cobra lily and here you can see jack. And this is the dying leaf of most erisemas because they come up in spring and about the end of June, the leaf just fades and disappears and they're gone for another year. Here is another one. This is from Japan, Sekokianum. And these are absolutely hardy in Asheville. And you can get them at, um, I have the Logies is one. I wanted to mention two or three. I'll wait till the end. I'll wait till the end and I'll tell you where you can get some of these bulbs. But Aram again is like the Jack in the pulpit. And this is the Italian Aram, which you grow because in late winter to early spring, these wonderful leaves appear, but the flowers don't show up until the fall. And this is what the flower looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the, the, the Jack is here till you know it belongs to the same family, but this is the spade and it's ghostly whitish green. So here's something you grow to point out the flower to people who are interested in oddities, but you grow it in the garden because the leaves are so incredibly interesting. Now, a little bit more about Jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit is called in the parlance memory root. Now, does anybody know why it's called memory root? Years ago, when kids used to walk around the woods and people weren't worried that they were going to be kidnapped and taken as slaves to ancient properties in Africa, um, you would walk along and the new kid on the block would be it. And the other woods would say, hey, Jeff, did you ever taste these berries? And Jeff will say, well, no, because he's obviously from Long Island City, and he never saw one of these in his life. So they give him one of these berries. And I wanna tell you, they are wickedly, wickedly bitter and sour. And you'll almost swear that you're being poisoned, but you spit them right out. And of course, if the seeds hit the ground, it's another plant in the next season. Here is another absolutely beautiful cultivar of the Aram. This is Palestinian. These are found in the deserts of Palestine. And oh, these yeah. will grow here in Asheville. And in this case, because they come from an area that really is warm, you have to remember to mulch them heavily or just dig them up after the leaves have dried and that's something everybody should remember about both. Let the leaves ripen, turn green, then brown, and then fall to the earth before you dig up the bulbs, if you're going to. This is Babiana. And Babiana is another absolutely beautiful bulb. In this case, it comes from South Africa. And it is all, it was never hardy when we first came here 30 years ago. But of course the climate is warmed here to the extent that all your, all the things that you mentioned and Rick wrote in memory books about your garden I'm, I'm have to be changed. Right now. Because today these will make it through the winter. And this is a calocortis. This is an American wildflower, originally from the West Coast. And you'll notice here is a fly. This is a bee fly, 
that's been attracted by this incredible array on the inside of the petals. And if this one isn't something, look at this one. This is Calicordus westonii, and this is another California wildflower. And you can put these in the garden. They all need good, well-drained soil. And some of them are marginally now, whether they'll live through the winter or not, because we never exactly know what's coming. But it's so easy to have an area in the garden where you plant some of these bulbs so that you have a continual show from spring to fall. And you just dig them up when the, when the leaves dry, dig up the bulbs, cut off the leaves that are left, brush off the dirt and store them in a cool, dry place for the winter. Now these are caladiums and there are a plethora of caladiums today, all different colors, and they actually will all live through the winter. Not in a pot yet, but I'm figuring that within another four or five years, this pot full of dirt, we will never have a winter cold enough to freeze the dirt in the pot. This is a canna lily, and Canna lilies, if you plant them by a telephone pole, and there's a house down the road from me, they've had, they've had it in there for three years. And these are getting bigger and bigger because the telephone pole radiates heat below the surface in the winter so that they stay nice and warm. Here's another canna. This one is called Cleopatra. And this one is from the Dallas Gardening Club. And those of you who have been to Dallas will be amazed to know that there is a Dallas Gardening Club, but they are continually busy. I only saw these in bloom once, and that was on a trip that I took to England with a bunch of Ashevillians back in the end of, oh gosh, when was it? It must've been 1992 or 93. And these are cardiocrinum and these lilies are on stalks that are six to seven feet high. It takes six years to flower from seed. And once they do flower, they die. But if you've kept planting the seeds year after year, by this time, you always have ripening bulbs that are going to release seeds and you'll always have flowers for the future. Clivia or clivia are, have been a house plant for like 200 years. And this is a new one called Golden Dragon. And this is Clivia Monada. And these make the greatest indoor pot plants because they have wonderfully dark green, leathery, long strapping leaves that last for the year. And then of course they put up new flowers in the spring and they'll do it year after year. And all you have to do is eventually when the roots become too tightly packed, you move them to a, a bigger pot, generally about an inch larger than you had before. And this is colchicum. This is a crocus, but it's the autumn crocus. And in the spring, instead of flowers, they send up these tall, strappy, not very attractive leaves, especially if they're in a garden setting, they look like weeds. But by June, they disappear. And then along comes the end of August into September and October, and you get these beautiful, beautiful flowers. And they are called colchicum. If you ever want to do in some 
nasty aunt that you have that controls a fortune, uh, put some of this in her tea because colchicum is very, very poisonous and it is actually the source of colchis, which is a drug that is used today to treat gout. And here's another one. This is an unknown that showed up in the garden. So that came from crossing of the genetics of the water lily and another unnamed culture come down the line. These are crinum lilies and they do not look like they could survive a winter because if you'll notice over here, wherever I took this picture of them, this is Spanish moss. So it must have been down in South Carolina. But when they're near the water, which they love, and you mulch them in Asheville, they make it through the year or you grow them in a pot. But there again, they are absolutely so beautiful. And this is a close up of the flowers. And they too have this amazing fragrance that comes out in the evening when they are opened that day. This is Cocosma or Cocosmia. This is another one of the bulbs. And here I have it planted in the front of the house in a stone basin of dirt. And these come up every year and I've mixed them with caladiums. And this comes up generally because it's against and it's of the wall of the studio in my house. So the wall is warm enough to keep these comfortable. And I might add, as you drive through Asheville, you will often see figs in bloom and producing fruit, and you will see bananas as plants. And if you'll do a little checking, and I have, they've all been planted by knowledgeable people next to the sewer pipe that comes into the house. So if you wanna grow a banana, plant it next to the sewer pipe because it has that continual warmth that prevents it from being killed by the cold. Crocus, this is a drawing I did for a plant book on crocus. And I just think they're so wonderfully simple and lovely. And this is a very, very famous crocus. This is the saffron crocus. And if you ever try to buy saffron, you'll find that it's like $120 an ounce. And the saffron comes from here, where my arrow is. And you can never grow enough to have a real Indian dinner for a lot of people but it's always fun to grow the crow. And Peter? Thomas Jefferson is where are we in our area? And these are crocus. I've just been told my internet connection is unstable. I hope you're all getting this. I have no way to find out. You are. You, you, are you there? Yeah. Is everything coming through okay? Yeah, yeah. Fine. yeah. Because I just got this notice and then the notice disappeared. Anyway, these are crocus. And if you take a, a jar, one of these glass jars, it's like a ship in the bottle. You can put dirt in the bottom, plant the crocuses, and make sure you water them. And eventually they will come up open and bloom inside the jar. And people will wonder, now how in heaven's name did you do that? And of course, a great thing is if you'll let them after they bloomed, pull out the flowers and let the leaves go along and dry. And you can then throw these out into the garden and they won't bloom the following year, but a year later they will. It takes a little time to catch up from the strength that is needed to do 
what these have done. Now, cyclamen, there are two cyclamen that are harding in Asheville. And I'm going to go over a few of these because I really think that cyclamen are so beautiful. And this is cyclamen hederofolium. And this is cyclamen persicum, the Persian cyclamen, growing in a pot. And this is a seedling from this plant. And you'll notice that already the flowers are slightly different. They smell incredibly sweet. And I do have a story about this. It turns out that cyclamen persicum come from the deserts of the Middle East where they are protected. And about 20 years ago, I received a phone call in May from the airport in New York City where I was visiting. And they said, if you will come to the LL counter we will keep them for you for two or three days. There is a brown tiger paper bag with some something I can't name waiting for you. So when I got out there, they treat this with secrecy because of course they came from the deserts. But I had done a logo for the Holy Land Conservation Fund and they didn't have any money to pay me, but they said, what could we do for you? And I said, well, I'd love a couple of these corms. And they say, done. So this plant that you're looking at is now in my greenhouse. It had 200 blossoms this year, and it is now in a, in a, a nine inch pot. That is, the corm is almost nine inches wide and hundreds of flowers every spring. Here is a close up, and you can see how the leaves of the cyclamen are beautiful to look, look at in addition to the flowers. And here's another cyclamen. This is one of the cyclamens that you will actually be able to buy um, today because some of them get to be very, very large flowers and they're usually offered for Mother's Day. And dahlias, a world of dahlias, and here is a dahlia bed. And I blush to say, this is a guy, he was in the club. He lived over on Spooks Branch Road and he had the most incredible collection of dahlias. Does anybody remember? I, I'll remember, but it'll be, it'll be at three o'clock in the morning. But he had a dahlia bed. And if you ever want to see dahlias in bloom, don't forget that when you go out to um, the college uh, at the end on I-40, about 20 miles out on I-40 from Asheville, Haywood Tech, they have a big dahlia show every fall. How many of you have ever driven out and drove through Haywood Tech? They have a rhododendron display garden that is incredibly beautiful. And they were actually building on a plot of land that was given to them when the Haywood Tech started. And the first thing that the organization running the school, future school did was to start cutting trees for a parking lot. And the man who gave the money called them to a meeting and he said, there is a garden designer, one in the Asheville phone book. His name is Doan Ogden. Will you please hire him to go over and give you a plan for this property. Because if you don't and you continue to cut things down without knowing what you're doing, I'm gonna take it back. And the, the, they came to see Don Ogden, he designed the property and it is well worth your visit. 
This is Dranunculus. It's another member of the uh, Jack in the Pulpit family. Only the flowers are really rare looking. And Ediminium, this is the Ediminium Hispanica. These are Spanish bluebells, English bluebells, and of course, they are weedy. Once you plant these, you'll never be without them. But the, I can never remember them being in the way of anything else that you wanted to grow succeeding. So I think it's nice in the spring to have lots of them around. And here we are looking at bluebells, Spanish bluebells surrounding Oligularia dentata, so named because of the dentations in the leaf. Now, Aranthus, when this blooms, they're late. Now, they're through. They bloomed more than a month ago. And the ground is a cloth of gold. But they are a spring ephemeral, and spring ephemerals are all these wonderful bulbs that come up and have to fulfill their life cycle before the leaves on the trees come out so that they get that early sunshine uninterrupted by maple leaves and oak leaves and such. They cover the ground with a carpet of gold and it is worth having them just to be able to walk in the midst of that beauty once a year for at most two weeks. These are Erythronium trout lilies. And this is another marvelous American wildflower. And they have wonderful spotted leaves. They're a bulb. And there are now Chinese and Japanese species entering the market that are larger flowers than the American. You all know this. This is the pineapple lily. When I first came to Asheville, this would not overwinter. But now, if it's near a house foundation, just to protect it for the few times a year when it gets really cold, like it did last week, they come up year after year. And fritillaria, the Brits call these the frits, and you put them in with tulips and narcissus and bulbs of that sort that you plant for early spring color. And this is a drawing of a snowdrop from a book that I found in a antique bookstore that showed paintings of the breeding processes of wildflowers. And of course, it is a snowdrop. And the picture taken of these snowdrops with their bulb didn't bother these plants at all. They were dug up, picture taken, and replanted. And if you were ever going to wow somebody, at a spring luncheon. Remember that you can go out and dig up snowdrops in March and put them in a teacup or something and bring them to the table that everybody has a touch of spring and then go out the next day and replant them. Doesn't bother them a bit. But if you do it in August or September, it kills them. So knowing that you can do this is a wonderful thing to have. Here's a bunch of them taken in a photograph out at the, the, um, the big uh, botanical gardens up in the mountains at 450 acres of beauty. Galtonia, they're called the summer hyacinths. And they have a stem that goes up about five feet. And they're just like a gigantic hy hyacinth, except that they're that Oh. and a beautiful, beautiful plant to spread around in the back of the border. Gladiolia, you know, but there are some hardier members of the Gladiolia family that are being turned out by the nursery industry. 
so that eventually you can have these in the backyard year after year, your only duty being to split the corms when they get too crowded. And this is the Gloriosa lily. And this is a real warmth water, but they grow beautifully in pots. As long as you put in a couple of small stakes to give them something to climb on. And in pots, you can give them a rest and you can top dress them by putting a little bit of fresh soil on the top of the pot after every time they bloom. And these will bloom twice a year for you forever on, as long as you care for them properly. This is a new form. And this is the lutea, the golden yellow. And this is her hermodactylus. This is called the widow's iris because this comes up every year on the side of our house in the garden that's there through the dirt in the garden that I have never done anything to except fertilize it every couple of years just for the hell of it. This comes up, it's called the widow's iris. And most people have never even heard of it. And it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, this is the hippiastrum. This is the amaryllis. And of course, I have one upstairs. Four flowers are so heavy, I had to prop them up this year. This is an amaryllis bloom. And you can see how wonderfully large and colorful and complex they are. And here's a Pico T. amaryllis that Peter Gentling had in his garden. He had to dig it up, but you can always find room to store a few bulbs if they're once our little and bring them out once a year to stun everybody by their beauty in, in the garden. These are hyacinths, you're all familiar with them. But remember that each year there's a new shade that's come out. So you never are not without an opportunity to grow a new color variation in the garden. Iphion, this is a member of the iris family and mm -hmm. they will grow in an area as long as they get spring sunlight without interruption of leaves, they will become hardy. They come from South Africa. And this is Monet's blue bearded iris. Such an absolutely beautiful plant. And this is a cultivar of the bearded, bearded iris. And here is a Louisiana iris called Purple Majesty. Wow, beautiful. And question, what? Oh, I just heard something. And this is a Japanese roof iris. It actually likes to grow on a roof. Of course, if it's tile and an antique Japanese house doesn't hurt because it wants water and perfect drainage. This is Iris pseudochorus, which is gigantic as a plant, sometimes can be a disgraceful weed, but often the flower is so beautiful it's worth it. And this is Iris sibiricus, which is another one of these irises that blooms and grows in bunches and makes it through the winter without any trouble. This is leucogen. This is the giant snowdrop. Instead of being a couple of inches high, these are like 16 inch high stems with the blossoms hanging down, each petal with a little dot of green. And of course, lilies. They are wonderful. And I do remember that I have been growing a couple of lilies in the front yard garden. And I had heard that 
they are really nocturnal. And it turns out they are. They're, they're open by day. But if you go out into the garden at night, the scent of the lilies or on a, it can also happen on one of those dismal summer days where the sky is almost black. You can smell the lilies at the bottom of the garden. And the smell is wonderful. But I actually went out there one year to see who or what was eating the pollen. And I had a flashlight with me. And the man across the street, who was a retired Air Force colonel from the recruitment section of the Air Force, didn't come home. He was awake. He saw me doing it. But he asked his wife, who came over and asked my wife why I was out in the garden with a flashlight and a lot of flowers at midnight. And when it was explained, we later became very good friends. But he thought only a nut would be doing something like that. This is like chorus. This is another one of our lilies. The English call these naked ladies because the flowers are incredible, but there are no leaves. But if you have them in your garden, you will note that the leaves are all there right now. And I've got dozens of these flowers that will come along in July and August. This is Mirabilis. This is a wonderful annual. This is called the four o'clock because it blooms about four o'clock in the afternoon. But if you dig them up, you can keep the bulbs of these over winter just in a dry place without any water and no freezing and get ahead on four o'clock for the following year. And this is a cultivar, you'll see it's a lighter, lighter blue. These are Moreia, and these are another three petaled like iris, flower from South Africa. And this is Muscari, you of course all know these as grape hyacinths. But how many of you have seen this? These are a cultivar of the grape hyacinths called plumosum. Mm. And you can get them at good bulb dealers and a mass of these in the front part of your rock garden are really stunning. And then there are the narcissus and the daffodils. And the narcissus have the sweetest smell and the shortest trumpet. The daffodils all have wonderful smells, but never as intense as the narcissus. And of course, daffodil trumpets are larger. But we have had a good year of these, except the chill last year, I mean, last week, killed. I had dozens of these in bloom, and I couldn't cover enough of them, and they just went. This is Nymphaea. This is the water lily. And most people have no idea that the water lilies are, will live forever if they're put in a pond. The only problem is that like many things in nature, you can have too much of a good thing. And if they're once in a place like Lake Huntington, they begin to spread. So I had to take them out and just bring them in and put them in the basement for the winter. This is Solomon seal. And there are three kinds of Solomon seal, short, medium, and tall. And these were taken at a friend of mine's garden up in Town Mountain Road, growing underneath a walnut tree. So if you're looking for a flower that is not going to be killed by a walnut, Solomon seal is the thing to look for. And then, after they've bloomed, they make wonderful little grape-like berries and collect them and you'll have more Solomon seal for the following year. And this is a friend of mine's, this is Edmund Taylor's garden over, over in the 
trying to think. He's on the other side of camping. And he's the only person I ever saw who took one of those teak wood garden benches and painted it blue. And I, as far as I'm concerned, he did a great thing because this is so beautiful, this bench sitting in the small glade. And this is a grove of Solomon seal that just spreads year after year. And no two stems ever come up in the same place, but they'll be an inch or two to the left, an inch or two to the right, or they'll move over to where they were four years before. Pushkinia are wonderful little flowers that bloom in the fall sometimes, in addition to the spring, and they're from Russia. And sanguinaria, these are the bloodroot. And of course, the thing to know about bloodroot is that they once were the source of a toothpaste that was supposed to keep your teeth in incredible condition. But it turns out they can also make you very ill if you kept using the toothpaste. So that has disappeared from the market. But they bloom in early spring. And they also have leaves. This, by the way, is multiplex, one of the worst names I've ever heard for a flower. It sounds like a place with 27 theaters with nothing playing that you want to see. But this, of course, is a many petal sanguinaria. And Sprachelia, these come again from Africa. And Cilia, these are little bulbous flowers that will carpet your lawn by self-seeding. They're up before the daffodils. You never see the leaves, you never see the leaves turn brown because it's always hidden by the growing grass. And they will disappear and you won't see them until the following year, when for a week they turn your front lawn, front lawn into an ocean of blue. Here they are planted around a tree with daffodils in the back. These are Tigridia. These are another beautiful flowering bulb that comes from Africa. And there are more, except for parts of America, most of the bulbs that are really fascinating come from Africa. And these are the trillions. Now, everybody in the men's garden knows this, but for those of you who do not, it is a wonder to realize that the trilliums are native to this area, that every year as they continue to rip apart the mountains, they'll come upon a cove that has never been touched and they often find a new variety of trillium. The problem with trillium, if you grow them from seed, it takes seven years for them to flower. Hmm. This, of course, is the yellow trillium, which is just like the one we previously saw, except the leaves have these wonderful markings on them. And anybody who can find a way to keep the trilliums in the garden all summer into fall, you've got your fortune made. Here is a beautiful pink trillium. And this is known as the quadrillium because it has four petals. And these were very expensive 10 years ago, but they're not very expensive anymore. And tulipa, the tulips of course are wonderful. And I'm not talking about the tulips that you find over at Biltmore. These are called species tulips. They're not colonial tulips. And they're fragrant. 
and they come back year after year. Unlike these tulips, which are beautiful in the garden when they're there, but eventually they disappear. And this is at Peter Gentling's garden where he always finds a little place to put some sculpture. And here we have another one. This is by Flora, a species tulip. And they will carpet an area and they'll be gone by, but they like hot spots. They want water in the spring, but the rest of the time they want great drainage to be warm and hot and be left alone. And here's black parrot. And this is Beautiful. another black, no, the last one was queen of the night. This is black parrot. And the interesting thing to know about these tulips, the reason these petals are all fringed like this, they have a virus infection that carries through from plant to plant. And Watsonia, which are next best to gladiolia. And frankly, I, I like them better than the gladiolia because the flowers are a little bit smaller and a little bit more colorful. And finally, this is the calla lily and they will grow now through the winter, just plant the bulbs about six inches deep in good friable soil. But these flowers are so beautiful and people are always amazed to realize in Africa, where in South Africa, they grow in ditches along the side of the road. And to go from growing in a ditch to being the flower in every 30s musical, if it didn't have a calla lily somewhere in the plot, it wasn't a 30s. Miracle. So that's it. And all of these are available. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send to Warren the addresses of the people that you can get these bulbs from. And then, of course, you can order them. And there are spring bulbs and fall bulbs. So just remember, you can have them with you whenever you need. Now, are we Any, all there? Anyone have questions? Thank you, Peter. I'm here. I'm going to stop your share. I've got a question. Uh, I was particularly thinking about it with the tulips, but uh, do a lot of these other varieties, uh, tulips seem to be Deer, deer food in our area. Uh, do the species tulips also uh, attract deer? Oh, they're much, they're smaller and as such more beautiful, and they come up year after year. The problem with the tulips over at Biltmore, it's an incredible business in Holland. Acres and acres, I mean meta acres of the land is devoted to growing tulips. <laughs> But all of that effort at Biltmore, when the tulips are through blooming, they just come up and they rip them out of the soil and throw them in a bucket. And they're used in compost because there's no way that they can come back again. They're used once and that's it. Mine come back and they just never, never get a flower because uh, the deer chew the flower up. They'll bypass the the uh, daffodils and go straight to the tulips. Well, if you if you if you get some of the tulips over at Biltmore and you allowed them to age the leaves so that the bulb got some nutrition, some of them will send up a flower the second year, but not all of them. And by the third year, it isn't worth it at all because there won't be any. So that's an incredible expense they have over at Biltmore, is to replant and bring those things in from the, from the Netherlands. That's why their fees are so high. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? I have a question. 
Peter, did you say uh, who was after the pollen on the lilies at midnight? Oh, it was the most marvelous thing. Do you, ever, do you remember the big grasshopper like Katie did? The grasshopper like insect that sings Katie did, Katie did, Katie did at night in the trees. They were there. Grasshoppers were there. Beetles were there. Because the pollen in lilies, you'll know if you have a white silk blouse and you ever get lily pollen on it, you can't get it out because yeah. they're full of protein. So all of these insects know that they're getting a great meal if they're out eating the pollen on a lily. Thank you. And the other time he got upset, by the way, is I have this beautiful white camellia and we had like 25 years ago, one of these incredible storms where it'll be just above zero and the wind will blow 20 miles an hour. So I had to go out and cover this camellia with a ladder, on me on the ladder, and nobody to help with a blanket. And then tie it around the bottom so it wouldn't blow away. And he, he was up, but he had to send his wife over to ask my wife why I was climbing a bench and covering a shrub. So that's the reason why it isn't as beautiful out there as it could be. Go ahead, Linda. Hi there. I would just like to say, I am not a member of the Men's Garden Club, of course, but I really enjoyed your presentation. And it was a great reminder of our interactions at our Nature's Notebook class at AB Tech, because Peter yeah. is so knowledgeable and has, I'm not sure what the word is exactly, acerbic might be the right word, comments <laughs> to make along the way to entertain you while you're learning about flowers or some artist. Well, I love AB Tech and I hope you all realize that that is one of the most valuable assets that this city has. The city apparently and the county continually forget about that. And um, it's a valuable institution and they have wonderful classes for adults there and try them sometimes because there's parking and it's comfortable and it's intelligent. Isn't that right, Linda? Yep. Especially Linda, I'm going to make this uh, video. Plan. I'm going to make this video um, available to Peter and he can share it with the other class members as well. That would, that would uh, be wonderful. I'd love to, to, I don't have any idea how to make it work, you know, once you've recorded it, but I'll try to figure out because I'm well, thinking it, of several. It'll be on YouTube. You can watch it at any time you want. Okay. Because I, I know several people that would like to, not necessarily in Peter's class, but some people here in, in Hawthorne who are on the garden committee, for instance, who might like to, to uh, see the video. Well, I thank Warren for the opportunity. And it's nice to know that Warren is out there beating the shrubbery for things to bring attention to the garden club, which is an, another great institution. And there is no reason why, when in this area there are 16 or more women's garden clubs, that men can't have a garden club without having women members. I don't think anybody's being cruel at all. We our meetings are open to everyone. That's right. That's right. So I'm going to pause the um, the recording now, unless someone else has a question they want recorded. I don't see anyone. So.